Thanks very much, and, and I'm pleased to uh, be able to talk to you about uh, a community-based strategy to fight Ebola, and, and uh, it's an operation that we've uh, been privileged to be involved in. Um, I want to first put in a little bit of context. Uh, of course, we see the, uh, the Ebola virus disease at the center of this, uh, as, and, and this here is a, a picture of the, uh, the emerging epidemic in terms of the number of cases and deaths. And as you can see, although it started sometime in December, we're now in the, uh, in the exponential part of the curve, and so it's an increasing uh, concern about this, and I think others are going to talk more uh, specifically about the patterns. But it's not just about a virus uh, that, that has started all this. There are a number of other types of epidemics that are going on in West Africa. First and foremost, after the uh, virus itself, is a contagion of, of fear and distrust, not only within the country, but, but our countries affected, but also internationally. Uh, and this has is, this is, uh, led to a number of other types of patterns that I think important to recognize as we put in context what we're doing and, and why. So one of them has to do with a series of of uh, self-reinforcing types of feedback situations that lead to epidemics, other types of epidemics, one of them being uh, with the health system itself. Now, it started off being an under-resourced, very weak health system. Uh, in fact, they had had four strikes before the Ebola outbreak because of inability to pay health workers. And when the, uh, when the uh, epidemic struck, of course, they've had a, a tragedy with lots of uh, losses of health workers, over 100 dead in Liberia alone. Hugely, huge problems with demotivation. Clinics have been closed. This, of course, leading to for worsening of health conditions. Collateral damage, not just for Ebola, but of course about other health conditions, common things now being malaria, uh, diarrhea, and, uh, and pneumonia. So this type of reinforcing system, but also in terms of the economy and livelihoods, as people are no longer going to the work, the fields are being fallow, are not being harvested. Uh, there's, of course, a loss of trade, uh, income, and poor nutrition, worsening the health, and, of course, a, a feedback cycle around this area. And then another one are really around social capital and institutions. As the, you know, as the government have been unable to deliver services to the type of need, there's been an increasing loss in trust of government and institutions, a real damage to uh, community cohesiveness and culture that is again reinforcing. Now part of the way of getting and breaking these cycles is through leadership. I wanted to highlight Tolbert Nienswa, who is the Assistant Minister of Health in Liberia, and he's the point person for the Ebola outbreak in, in Liberia. Uh, he's also a graduate, uh, MPH graduate of the School of Public Health and, and on faculty as associate with us. And he has written how it is important to uh, take international support in winning the public's trust uh, to, to uh, stop the Ebola outbreak. And his statement, which I've used for the title, is we must be helpful and stay hopeful. He is saying this not only to me and to the international audience, but to his own staff and, and his own people. And this, the logo, or sorry, the slogan within uh, Liberia is uh, something to the effect of uh, stay safe and keep serving. So uh, part of the uh, rationale for moving to a community-based strategy actually emerges from the experience in Liberia itself. And this run chart, I think this is actually written out by colleagues from Virginia Tech, uh, Caitlin Rivers, uh, but it shows basically the, the trends in cases uh, over the months in four cases. Montserrado is actually where Monrovia, the capital, is. But what you see here in Lofa County is the green, is the one that started off and is actually starting to tail off. And this is uh, one of the early counties where they had problems with fear, hiding patients, a lot of distrust. And what's happened is that communities are mobilizing in different ways to organize themselves to try to uh, address the epidemic. And what it is is that this has become the focus for how their community care center is being managed in Liberia is really emerging out of these, out of these emergent properties uh, in, in Lofa County itself. Uh, there are some other uh, rationales, but this is, these are some pictures taken from Dr. Francis Kata, who's known to us in the, in the hospital, but he's actually in charge of the community care center uh, program. And what he's showing here is, is in Liberia, there, there's not a lot of running water, and this is the kind of creativity that they are doing to create places where people can wash hands. In this case, this is at a roadside uh, stop, and this is another place. So actually trying to find ways to, local ways of trying to um, 
um, improve hygiene. So these are sort of things that are happening by the community themselves, a lot of innovation. There's some analysis that also backs up the notion of a community, uh, a community approach that's needed. So a group, uh, Brian Lewis and Caitlin, who were collaborating with at Virginia Tech, took the CDC models, updated them, and tried to model uh, some of the strategies. Here's the, basically the, the US strategy of bringing in lots of beds and hospitals, and you can note from here uh, sort of the, the epidemic curve and a projection uh, in February. But what was realized that is actually you need a lot of external mobilization. And if you model actually uh, taking the, adding to the beds a massive social mobilization and the CCC strategy, you can come up with a lower projection. So there's some analytic support uh, to, uh, or modeling support to, uh, to support this type of approach. Uh, but the other, uh, the other, uh, I think rationale comes from experience itself. And this is another one of the big leaders I think that we should recognize in this outbreak. This is the Minister of Health from uh, DRC Congo, uh, Felix Kabange. And uh, uh, they have experience with seven prior epidemics of Ebola and they're currently managing an eighth. And he has, in discussions he was having with, with us, uh, with UNICEF and others in New York, uh, describing that the control actually depends on a community-based containment and care strategy. And it was during these discussions that he actually offered to say that we have 120,000 doctors and nurses in, in Congo. We have the experience. He's offered to bring 1,000 of them and their experience to West Africa. And that's what, where he specifically asked Hopkins to get involved to work with UNICEF on the logistics side, but also WHO, MSF, and the act other actors involved, including the, the World Bank. And so part of the task was to facilitate how this works, uh, and, and it's useful, I think, to show his perspective of how the Ebola outbreak is actually working. And so this is from, uh, these are the ideas of Felix Kabange, going back again to these notions of vicious circles, of vicious cycles. Now what you see here is the source of transmission at the community, hospital, and burial level. And these are where the transmission occurs, a community when you have patients, when you're trying to identify them, identify sick people, bring surveillance in, and try to transport them. At the hospital level itself, you do the screening, you do the sorting, and then you have the patient care. So there's exposure both to other patients and family members as well as to the hospital staff. And then burial where, uh, again, intensive context. Now, I think it's worth saying a word about burial. Burials, funerals are important in every society. They take a special place in West African society and practice, not just because of what happens with inheritance and, and dignity for the dead, and but it's also the approaches uh, involve often very long funerals. Often it's the next of kin who are expected to wash the body. Other people will touch the body many times, wash in a common pot, and it's common to have prolonged funerals that may last all night or all day, and it's a very, it's a critical and central part of what brings the community together. So we're, we're asking for some major behavior change. And what he's noticed here is that there's an epidemiologic component around identification, context, taking care of patient, and, and again, contacts during um, during the burial, and there's an important human behavior component, as he's called it. And what we're seeing here is this disempowerment, this invasive approach that reinforces fear, it's stigmatizing survivors, and that is reinforcing these, the bad sides of, of the epidemiologic control and the care uh, th at all three levels, the community, hospital, and burial. And so their notion, again, of how it has worked successfully in Congo is basically by combining the human behavioral and the epidemiologic uh, aspects as well as the clinical aspects at the community, hospital, and burial, where you try to in reinforce ownership of the fight, integrate survivals, provide high quality of care for survival and dignified death, and of course, dignified burial. And this is sort of the notion that's trying to be reinforced. And you know, I have to say that, that the Congolese have lots of experience in doing this, and they certainly are calm in the face of, of a storm, uh, but a lot of this knowledge is tacit knowledge, and so a lot of the role that we have played at Hopkins uh, is to try to formalize that knowledge in a way it can be extended and reinforced um, and put in a way that we can, we can, um, can actually get it implemented further in, in West Africa. And so part of this notion was around uh, putting together what the, uh, what the CCC concept is, the Community Care Center concept. Uh, so uh, this is a lot of text here, I intended to show it differently, but the, the, the core is really this 
this multidisciplinary team that's able to act in a local area, working in a defined area that combines strategies at all three levels of the community, hospital and burial. It depends on trained paid workers and paid volunteers. Uh, and then of course, there's a whole series of standard operating procedures that we're working with them and trying to operationalize around ways of minimizing exposure to community members as well as protect health workers, uh, providing the types of facilities to screen patients in separate areas, as well as having its own lab uh, and outreach services and logistics. So it's a package that has to come together, and this is basically trying to codify the response uh, that we've been uh, that we've been that they've done in in, Lib in uh, Congo. Now the the concept has been evolving in Liberia. Originally, they were having basically having. Uh, the CCC as being a center that would later transport to hospitals and they realized with the Congo experience we'll actually try and have this as a place where you can take care of patients. Uh, it's also the originally were plans to use community members and volunteers to be the transport and, uh, and uh, caregivers and we've tra transformed that or they have transformed that into uh, now having paid uh, health workers and professionals managing it. This is sort of the schematic of what it looks like in terms of how they come in. There's also a facility for those that, you know, healthcare for those that don't have Ebola if you, if you set it up at the site. But basically, this is sort of the schema for, uh, for what it looks like. And just to give you an idea, uh, the DRC Congo team will have about 33 people that has sort of a coordination management side. We have a treatment center side with uh, clinicians, biologists, labs, a community outreach side, and a, and a safe burial team. And I notice about half of the clinicians are actually nurses that are involved. Uh, on, the, on the Liberian team, it's about 60 people. We're going to rely largely on their community leaders and community health volunteers at, for care assistance, education, and burial disinfection uh, type of management. And of course, we're going to need some translation, literally translation, French, English translation, although we're trying to get as many English speakers as possible into the, uh, into the program. So that's basically an idea of what the team looks like. I wanted to highlight some of our first responders, if I'm going to call them that. You know, within literally the same day of finding out about uh, the Congo offer, we had uh, three people to come over to, uh, to work in Congo and developing the protocols and putting the concept together. So I want to, uh, you know, note particularly uh, these three. Nancy Glass, a professor in the School of Nursing, uh, whose uh, leadership and expertise not only of Congo and the technical ability, but also to understand what the, what the concept is and what the role of Hopkins is, which is really around trying to standardize, codify the knowledge and provide mentoring and support to do this. Uh, Trish Pearl uh, was kindly able to uh, jump across and, and work on developing both the clinical and the infection control protocols, thankfully is fluently bilingual. Uh, and play, is continuing to play leadership there. And Angelique Coley, who is a, a recent graduate from the School of Public Health, works with Nancy in the School of Nursing in Congo and was able to help out, particularly on the community mobilization aspects. So we have ongoing team here, and I just wanted to, um, I guess this is an old set of slides. I wanted to show you about the 30 or so people that uh, are currently involved uh, for across the School of Public Health Nursing. This is not the slide, but, uh, but just to, in terms of who, who you should pay attention in particular. So Trish is being the point person on the clinical protocols and infection control, with, and Tom Quinn is helping out with that, and we're relying on a number of people to provide assistance and support for there. Uh, Derek Cummings is taking the lead on the epidemiology and the, it's the data that are going to be needed for day-to-day uh, -day management and assessment and trying to merge the protocols with the management. And Ellie Leoncini is going to be heading up the community uh, mobilization aspects and has a large team with that. And we've got about a dozen people who have already in the field are volunteering either to go to Congo or to uh, Liberia initially and potentially elsewhere. And, and you know, so I wanted to, uh, I won't be able to show them, but there are many people and, and you know, we welcome more support on that side. Uh, what this is here is basically uh, why we're involved and how we can work. And this is not things that I'm telling you. This is things that were told to us why we needed to be involved. And one is that we are an honest broker and can negotiate between governments and the different agencies, uh, some of which have lots of experience. And I should say related to that is that we have alumni and professional networks across these agencies. And that's important to be able to draw on. Uh, we initially got involved because of the need for analytic support, and you're going to hear more about that from Josh later and perhaps from Derek. 
Uh, but it's also, it's notably, it's a multidisciplinary type of support, and they're particularly interested in our experience with epidemics and implementation research. We are able to provide training, technical support, and advice, although, again, it's a real challenge trying to match up our responsibilities here with clinical teaching and otherwise. Uh, but, you know, we're somehow managing. And, of course, a large area of, of specific expertise that's, that's needed. Uh, and we actually need to rely on our good name to be able to stand behind protocols that are developing because a lot of these protocols will not, there won't be the evidence uh, to support them and, uh, and there's a lot of other agencies that won't be able to stand behind them and it's really about making the most with the, what we have. And again, it's also about convening and influencing to support the fight. So I want to uh, end with a statement from the front lines. This is a picture of Francis Cata. It's a statement that he uh, had been giving to his, to his own staff and to his own population, uh, but I think is just as important for us to hear. And the message is that we are neighbors, community leaders, and global citizens uniting for the common good. With you, we can accomplish even more. Thank you very much.